Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Canola Week. I am Jason Castleman, and we're very happy to have you here with us both in person and virtually. And so for, before we begin, we'd just like to acknowledge that we are in Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. And thank you for our top sponsors this year of event, BSF and Bear. And a big thanks to Nutrien for sponsoring the students that we see here today, Manitoba Canola Growers, SAS Canola, Corteva, Alberta Canola, and we could not do this event without the support from the Canadian Canola Growers Association, New Seed, Syngenta, the Western Grains Foundation, Winfield United, John Deere, Cargill, and Decisive Farming by TELUS Agriculture. As noted yesterday, you can view agendas, conference attendees, and chat with speakers on the virtual platform. And we also encourage, it, encourage you to use it, as Jay mentioned, to fill out those four multiple choice questions uh, using Precision Agriculture Tools survey in preparation for his, uh, for his session. And for those who attended yesterday, please fill out the Canola Industry Day debrief survey and collect yesterday's Certified Crop Advisor credits if you haven't yet. For everyone attending today, we also encourage you to complete the short daily survey via the virtual platform at the end of the day. We will be showing the QR codes to collect CCA credits for this, for this day and in the afternoon at the end of the sessions as we did yesterday. You can use other functions on the virtual platform and except we ask that you mute the upcoming sound from the live stream if you do play it. While you're adjusting settings, you can also set your phone to silent. For those of you that are in the room, you can also find the agenda and speakers on the table for quick reference. We encourage you to tweet along throughout the conference using hashtag Canola Week 2022. So while we're acting in the, interacting in the room, keep everyone healthy uh, and, uh, and maintain social distance and minimize contact unless they indicate it otherwise. So now we'll get to the, right into the conference and I'll call up Joy Agnew, the chair for the first session. So Joy's career has been focused on applied research in agriculture and she joined Olds College in January 2019. At Olds College, Joy oversees the Olds College Centre for Innovation and the Research Division of the College, which focus on applied research in crop and livestock production with a focus on technology, integration and data utilization to improve productivity and sustainability of food production. Thank you very much and welcome on to the stage. Thanks, Jason. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to be here today back in Saskatchewan and opening up the uh, discussion for um, the Canola Discovery Forum 2022. So I am going to be talking a little bit about some of the technologies and tools that we have been working with on the Smart Farm at Olds College of Ag and Technology. Um, but I'm really going to be spending most of my time just setting the stage for the tremendous speakers that are coming after me and later today about really what is precision egg and how does it differ from things or terms like smart egg or digital egg? Um, so let's get into it. So really I am going to be answering the question, what is precision egg and what's it all about? So in its really fundamental definition, precision egg is all about accounting for the variability within a field and managing inputs accordingly. So conventional agriculture typically utilizes um, constant or blanket rates for inputs across the field. And this is typically because of technical or logistical constraints. Basically, it's, it's easier and more practical to apply the same rate of inputs across an entire field. Precision egg, however, is basically accounting for or utilizing those inputs more precisely and accounting for spatial and temporal variability across the field. So inputs that could be managed more precisely and include things like seed, nutrients, pesticides, water, really any input. Field variability or variability within a field or within a region is really driven by many, many different factors, including soil type and structure, topography, tree lines, presence of sloughs, the list goes on and on. The graphic on the right of this slide is just a really quick visualization of how much variability can be within a single field at various field depths. So this is depicting variability of water content, both spatially, so across the field um, area, as well as temporally. 
So throughout the season, at different time points, that variability and the magnitude of that variability can actually change. So some key concepts related to precision ag. Um, the, there is a lot of, I guess, anecdotal information and some scientific data that shows that spatially targeted applications of nutrients can improve efficiency and productivity of crop production. This is theoretically because applying things like nutrients, where and when they will be uptaken by the plants, will minimize or reduce losses through leaching, volatilization, or, or even runoff. So if those nutrients are being uptaken and used, we're going to reduce losses, which means theoretically we can reduce the amount of fertilizer or other inputs used and still maintain yield or possibly even increase yield. Now the challenge is knowing what that variability is and understanding what that potential nutrient uptake is going to be when we're talking about variable rate nutrients. Um, Variability within a field can be significant, and it's not easy to assess or measure. And that is the first critical step to deploying precision ag technologies or accounting for that variability is quantifying the variability or observing that variability within a field. Currently, this is done in several different ways, and there's all kinds of different tools and types of ob observations and data that can be collected to map out or understand that variability. So things like topography or soil information, plant information, yield, and going right down to even things like protein variability within the field um, as the crop is coming off. All of those things will drive or provide information or layers of data on what kind of variability there is in that field. Now everybody here in this room and online knows very well that there's all kinds of different approaches and methods for defining this variability and developing prescription maps. I am not here today to debate or discuss which method or process is best or right. Um, partly because I don't have the technical expertise to have that debate, uh, but mainly because I don't know or think that there is one right way to assess variability within a field to develop a prescription map. There's simple methods, there's complex methods, there's those that require, you know, really detailed information year over year, there's some that can be recycled year over year. Um, in my opinion, if a farmer has decided or determined that precision egg or variable rate is going to make sense for them in their situation, whatever system works for them is, is the right one. So there's lots of buzzwords out there related to precision ag, and, and one of them is smart ag. And working at a smart farm, I'm often asked to differentiate these terms. So this is, this is how I do that. So precision ag, as I've really kind of high level outlined, is, is really focused on accounting for variability within a field and managing inputs accordingly. Smart ag is beyond that. So smart agricultural concepts are broader than just variability. Um, and include all kinds of other tools and, and, and techniques that I'll talk about on the next slide. So one of the definitions that we use at the Smart Farm is that Smart Ag is the, is the utilization of technology and data to make science and evidence-based management decisions, all with a focus of improving productivity and sustainability of food production. So Smart Ag is, is broader than just variability. So some examples of what would be considered smart ag technology, uh, variable rate. So variable rate prescriptions for nutrients is, is considered a, a smart ag technology but also falls under the category of a precision ag, as does optical spot spraying for targeted herbicide application. So both of these are very much focused on managing inputs according to variability within the field. The others on this slide are now a little bit outside of that variability of, of field aspect, such as GPS guidance and auto steer to optimize field activities, sectional control technology to minimize overlaps in the headlands or around obstacles, using robotics and automation to complete field tasks to improve field efficiency or labor efficiency, uh, adoption of minimum tillage and other best management practices to maintain and, and preserve soil health and soil carbon. 
All of these are considered smart technologies, smart practices to improve productivity and sustainability, but they don't all focus on just the variability in the field. There's dozens of other examples I could have put on this slide, but the text would have been too small. But we're talking grain sensors, we're talking weather stations, we're talking um, protein sensors on combines. The list goes on and on. There's all kinds of technologies available to just help assess and help make evidence-based management decisions. So what about digital ag? This is another big word out there, a buzzword around, around precision of, of food production. Uh, but digital ag, for me anyway, is, is obviously focused more on data and specifically tools and processes to collect, manage, store, and analyze on-farm data for on-farm decisions. Or from a research perspective, it's utilizing and collecting that data for the development of new tools and algorithms. Digital ag can also refer to digitization of data, on-farm data that was previously maybe collected in notebooks or by other means to help with the analysis of trends and looking and visualizing changes over time. Because once you have robust data sets that you can look at trends over time, it may help make future management decisions. So back to Precision Egg for a bit. Um, I really wanted to just highlight the fact that Accounting for variability within the field and managing inputs accordingly is not simple or straightforward. There are a lot of components, a lot of information that needs to come together in order for this to work effectively. So some of the terminology associated with precision egg is listed on, this, on the screen. I am not gonna talk about each of them in detail. I just wanted to give you a sense of the scope of the technology and information that is really required in order to, to make this work. So some of the more common precision ag technologies in, in use today and on the Smart Farm at Olds College, obviously, is variable rate application of fertilizer. Um, the technology is available for variable rate of almost every input today, but fertilizer is by far the one that's, that's most well known and, and, and adopted. So as I've said, this is basically the development of a prescription map based on information about the variability of or expected nutrient uptake in that field. And that map is uploaded to the equipment controller and then the nutrients or the, the inputs are varied as the equipment travels through the field. Depending on the equipment, most modern day equipment is automatically equipped with the capability for variable rate, but depending on the equipment, it may vary that input application rate row by row or section by section. So variable rate of nutrients requires a prescription map and lots of historical and current data on the variability of nutrient uptake. Um, but there is technology available for spot spraying or optical spot spraying for targeted herbicide application that doesn't require a prescription map. This is in real time as you're traveling through the field, it is looking for weeds and targeting weeds. You're gonna be hearing a lot more about this in the uh, producer panel right after lunch. So I'm really looking forward to that. But basically the most currently available or commercially available optical spot spring technology is known as a green on brown technology. Meaning it is as it's traveling through the field, the sensors are looking for green patches and then targeting and spraying only those green patches, which is suitable for a pre-emergent or a post-harvest spraying, but not for an in-season spraying when everything is green. There is some work being done on green on green technology, however, and this would then be suitable for in-season spraying. Green on green optical spot spraying technology obviously requires high speed imagery, high speed data processing and machine learning algorithms to identify weeds versus crop. And then similarly, it's targeting and triggering and spraying only those weeds. There's also a lot of discussion and um, opportunity around variable rate um, pesticide or herbicide application using prescription maps. So just like variable rate nutrients, you can generate a prescription map for, for weeds um, through collected imagery, whether that's from drones, possibly satellites or other means, where you can generate a map of weed pressure in a field right before in-season spraying. And then you load that prescription into a, a conventional sprayer that's um, got the, the variable rate capability, and then variable rate herbicide application happens through that map. There is also a lot of discussion and wondering about the capacity for drones to do this. So high capacity drones, 
would not, would theoretically not require a prescription map because the sensors on the drones would be able to identify weeds or weed patches in real time and then also spray in that same, in that same flight pattern. Now it's very critical to note that there aren't currently, at least to my knowledge, there aren't currently any pesticides or herbicides that are registered to be um, applied using drones. So there's quite a bit of regulatory work that is going to be required before drones can be used for, for spraying activities. Now most of the technologies I've talked about to date have been very much focused on spatial variability within the field. Um, there are tools and techniques out there that will help for, account for temporal variability or variability from the beginning of the season, say to mid-season or late season. Um, for example, there's tools currently available for precision timing of fungicide application. So there's systems out there that help producers monitor spore loads, for example, so that they can assess risk prior to symptoms showing in the field and optimize that, that spray window or mobile apps and various other disease models and plant stage models that will really provide additional information to help make timely management decisions. So what is the future of Precision Ag? What, what could potentially be coming down the pipe with the advancement of technology, uh, data processing capacity, and just the brain power that is behind the ag tech movement? This is one of my favorite coffee room topics of discussion at, at Olds College because really this, the sky's the limit. Um, but basically I have some what I think or what we think are near-term option opportunities coming uh, to the sector as well as what may be a little bit further out. So near-term we really see and, and feel that there's a need for more options. More options available for prescription mapping services, ideally with options tailored to the specific needs or variability of the fields. Um, like I said, there's complex ways, there's simple ways, um, but really the, the degree of variability within a field should drive the method used for that prescription mapping, maybe. Um, more options available for identifying ideal timing of applications as well. The green on green herbicide application is, is in development. Uh, prescription and variable seeding rates or irrigation rates are possibly already in use. There's lots of discussion about the, the value of having multiple varieties or different varieties or maybe even different crops planted or growing in the same field depending on the, the field characteristics. So that could all be done in a single pass using a prescription. Targeted spraying and seeding using high capacity drones is potentially coming down, down the lane. Uh, again, requiring some regulatory work before that can happen. And then probably really far out or much further out than these other ones, there is the possibility of, of eliminating the need for prescription maps for variable rate nutrient application with the advancement of real-time sensing of plant available soil nutrients. Um, so in real time, as you are seeding and, and fertilizing, it'll be assessing soil nutrient requirements and then applying that variably as you're, as you're traveling through the field. And then really far out, um, this is sort of like the, the uh, what, what is it, the holy grail, I guess, of precision egg, right? Is moving from zone, like managing zone by zone to going all the way down to managing plant by plant. Um, I really believe the technology is going to allow us to get there. The question is, is it, does it make sense? Does it make economic sense to actually manage on a plant by plant basis? Just because we can doesn't mean we should because um, it all comes down to dollars and cents and overall productivity. So to quickly wrap up and give you a flavor of the types of questions I, I intend to um, pose to the, the panelists coming after me, uh, basically precision egg technology is all focused, much, it's very much focused around accounting for variability within the field, whereas smart egg technology is beyond that, but it's all about using tools and data um, and, and digital solutions to help make better management decisions. So variable rate technologies are relatively well established technically, but what are the issues that really need to address to drive adoption? How variable does a field have to be for variable rate technologies to make economic sense? This is, this is a big question and one that we hear all the time from producers. What degree of training or customer support is needed to ensure that growers are confident in using the, these technologies? I can tell you how many times I've heard stories of producers um, 
paying for a prescription map, but it not loading into the system correctly, so they just override it and do a blanket rate once again to the field because they need to get going. Is there a way to quantify the benefits of using variable rate technologies? Because at the end of the day, with, for producers, adoption always comes down to ROI. At the end of the day, it has to make economic sense for them. So how can we help them assess that? So I'm going to end there. I'm going to be inviting the, the speakers to come up and uh, talk a little bit more about the details of some of the precision ag technologies that are available for, with them. And then we will do a panel discussion and then Q&A from the audience. So thank you very much. We'll talk to you later. Good morning, everybody. Just, just waiting for my presentation to come on. This lovely morning in uh, Saskatoon. So, uh, yeah, we have uh, lovely weather. It's kind of all over. The good news is supposedly tomorrow in Alberta, we're supposed to get to minus four, so tropical heat wave. So, this morning, uh, I wanted to introduce, I'm Garth Donald. I'm the manager of, uh, of agronomy in Western Canada for decisive farming by TELUS Agriculture. I was uh, one of the uh, key uh, parts of decisive farming, the previous shareholder. So uh, we'll uh, carry on and let's uh, get into our subject. Now, Joy talked a lot about um, this information at the end of the day. So I want to just throw up, this is a Wikipedia of what precision agriculture. So precision agriculture is management concept based on observing. Measuring response to intra and uh, inter field variability crops. So yeah, that's the wordy version of, yeah, it's looking at the layers. And that's what precision agriculture, you know, Joy had those beautiful, I remember uh, one of her colleagues, uh, Dr. Alex Malinchuk, uh, myself worked together on many different projects and that was what it was always about, was the different layers of data. So. When we look at where is precision agriculture? So I'm gonna go at this kind of topic based on ourselves. So we're a variable rate uh, fertilizer and seed provider. Um, and so I'm gonna do it based on that aspect. So adoption is below 10% of total crop acres. And most of us have that understanding within. So it has been a struggle. And, and why is that? Well. Um, you know, our biggest competitor in the industry, and I'm not saying it's all of us, is unsampled acres. Um, we look at this across Western Canada of the lack of just soil testing, and we still have that to deal with, with clients. Innovators and early adopters grasped on this technology and they do see the value they've 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 done the rois they've sat down on their farms they've seen how this works and so they continue to go on but where are we dealing and, and it was mentioned early majority are still struggling to see the value of what it provides what they're currently doing so that is one that we have to look at of where does this come into play with everyone in Western Canada. Why do we not have this rapid adoption? And I always like to use that a lot like to compare in precision ag, the auto steer uh, introduction into Western Canada. And it hit and it was gone, like everybody in three, four years had auto steer. So that's where a lot like to compare to and that's a different aspect. So. I always like, I'm an iron head, I've always been, come from a farm, but where did we come from? Great old Saskatchewan company, no one really thinks back to it. 1996, Flexco brought out the first air seeder, or air cart, that was capable of reading prescription files. And I'm going to talk a little bit more within prescription files, because all these drills, even prior to that, had variable rate capacity. 
Variable rate, if you look at that definition, is the ability to move the rate up and down from the cap. That's the difference. Whereas reading a prescription file is actually a digitized file that the computers can read. Some of you remember the gray box in the Flex 2 controller. It looked like archaic, but that system worked great. Now, for those that are east of here in Manitoba, this was huge. Um, AgChem brought out soil election. And what was soil election? Soil election was their entry into variable rate across North America. It was the first four and six bin floaters. And I remember the day that it, uh, they started doing work in Portage Prairie area and it was such a cool thing to be able to do six products at one time going across the field. And that gave now the industry a way of doing variable rate. So all our retails, all our new equipment has this technology. I've not heard of somebody say, oh, well, yeah, don't buy that because it can't do it. It's there. So that's what we can utilize. How is the industry changing or what is changing in the industry? Well, Joey mentioned this, but this has been kind of our big thing. And we've, there's lots of panic, but there's lots of unknown. And this is where we feel that we definitely have tools to work within this system if this is what we do go to. Seven years ago, or plus, 10 years ago, how many people heard about 4R nutrient stewardship? It wasn't there. We are the stewards, and that's where this came in. This is why there's been more focus, because we are talking about soil. And we are talking about how do we keep it healthy? How do we do things in a more healthy environment for both the land, the producer, and the consumers? And this is a great way of starting it. And this is why. Consumers want to know how their food's produced. We were very lucky to be involved in a project uh, called Pollinator Pilsner where yes on the beer can has a qr code and you can scan that qr code and it starts it's start to finish we had a grower in Penold, alberta that took us through right from start to finish and watching it go on the truck to gibbons bc through persephone brewing and watching their process and having that information so it's geeky for me it's cool but for the consumer they got to see right from start to finish and know what's going on this is a big one, and this could be a day, two, three day topic just in itself. Lack of farmland due to urban sprawl. Um, and, and again, it's everybody wants their, their piece of the, the pie, so to speak, of they want their backyard and want this, but we're getting less land. And we seem to want to go out instead of up. So that's, that's a big one too. So why is adoption slow? You know, everybody says, well, you know, if everything can speed up in this industry. But these are some of the things that we looked at as a company, but understand as a company. Um, yeah, we've got growers in this, in Western Canada, that have tried VR with no results of what they were expecting. I think that's the key. What were they expecting? And I can, I can put my hand up and go, yeah, when I first started, did I actually ask the grower what he was expecting? And I could say no. When I first started, I was just, oh yeah, this is so cool. I love dirt. This is all great. And that may have not been what he was looking for. And I think that's where a lot of this has failed. We came with something, what we felt was fixing, but was it actually something they needed that needed to be fixed? So that's one of those thought process ones. Lots of promises were made with no type of ROI to show growers. And that was one of our biggest things was looking at return on investment when we started as going through with growers. Because yeah, as, as Joy mentioned, growers are not going to do things if there's no return on investment. So having that understanding, going through, and yes, 
being honest of showing if you didn't have a positive return on investment, don't hide it. Don't throw it behind. Oh, well, that's, you know, the proverbial ugly redheaded stepchild. No, address it. Why was there an issue? Large amount of producers are resistant to change. We are in the agricultural industry. How many people in this room or online have heard the term, well, grandpa did it this way, dad's done it this way, so I do it that way, without the question of, well, why? Does this, did grandpa grow the same varieties that what you're growing today? Probably not. So why are we treating them the same? How are we doing this? I love this one. This is probably the, one of the best ones I get at trade shows. It's the, the objection that tries to shut everything down. I'm close to retirement, so why do I change? Again, understanding what does it mean for your farm? And I think that's what it all comes back to, is understanding and asking what the expectations are. So we talk about that, but we have a large group that is, they are doing precision egg. They are doing variable rate. So they've seen positive results over many years, increased productivity on their fields, manage poor areas and reduce their loss per acre in those areas which comes back to increased ROI. And that's actually been in the last few years that have really focused with ourselves as a company is that, yeah, if they can't manage and everybody's answer is, oh, we'll plant grass there. I don't have cows. I got guys that have never have cows. The only thing that came across there that was cow-like was a buffalo. That was a long time ago. And so they're not going to plant grass. So we're going to manage those areas to reduce the potential losses, environmental, and be sustainable in those areas. And this was one of the big things that I, when I started from day one, and this is what growers told me, more even and easier harvest. And that is what we see within variable rate. So what does one look at for in precision ag as a provider? I always love this one. A consultant that talks and works with you. They should be a teammate. This isn't that I'm the God sitting on the ivory mountain. You shall do what I tell you. That's not what you want. You want somebody that works together with you. Something willing to tell you what you may not want to hear as a grower. That's always the, you know, we don't like to do that, you know, or hear that. But you have to have somebody that'll be open and honest and saying, hey, does that make sense? I've had growers in Manitoba that we sat down, oh, soybeans, we gotta keep growing soybeans. And then we sat down and looked at what a return was. And after four years, we'd lost $200,000 growing soybeans. So did it make sense? No. Someone will get you the answers when you ask the question. I've been at it for 16 years. Yes, I have a lot of knowledge, but I don't know every question. But the answer is, if I don't know, I will tell them. I don't know, but I'll get back to you right away. And I have a network. There's people in the room. There's people I have across the world that I have as my resource. This is the big one. And in agriculture, someone you can trust and who will give you an honest answer. And that has been the way forever. You have to have trust in who you're working with. And if you don't, I can tell you right now, you could have the best precision egg variable rate product in the world, but if they don't trust you, you're just basically as the proverbial used car salesman, they'll sell you anything just to get a buck and get you out the door. Future of precision egg. And I think this is the one that I look at. It is vast. There is lots, and there's different versions of precision egg. I met a grower out of Australia that his idea of precision egg 
was the simple, you know, just even touching the monitor of changing the rate across the field manually. Is he wrong? No. Is he putting the product where it needs to be? Yeah. So again, it can be as simple as that to as high tech as what Troy showed of, you know, the multi layers, the drones, the equipment. We can do that. We're stewards of this land. And we need every tool to keep that for many generations. And that's what we have to think about is the next generation that's taking over. And if we look at it as this way, precision ag, variable rate, fertility and seeding is that tool that helps us get there. So with that, I thank you and I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Now I'll wait for my presentation. <laughs> right on. There we go. All right, thank you everyone. Um, my name's Bonnie Manziak. I am the product marketing manager for FieldView in Canada. Um, just to give you a little background, I'm from Kelleher, Saskatchewan, so uh, about an hour west of Yorkton. Um, and I, where I live with my husband and my three kids where we farm with his family. Um, but I also grew up on a farm in Shell Lake, Saskatchewan, so about an hour and a half north of here. So as far, long as I can remember, agriculture has been a really important part of my life and uh, kind of how I've grown up. I've worked in the digital egg space for about the last seven years. And I just think it's really um, interesting and kind of amazing where we've gotten. When I think back to when I was in university in the late 90s and early 2000s, precision egg I may have been in one lecture. Like, it, it really wasn't talked about. So the fact that we're having conferences and, and all of these conversations and we're recognizing where it's going to take us and the answers or the problems it's going to solve, I think is really amazing. So I just kind of want to start by talking about some of the global trends. Um, I think Joy and Garth have done a really good job of setting the stage to talk about precision egg. So I'm just gonna kind of look at some of the trends we see and how we see this moving forward over the next few years. So there's, there's really four major mega trends that are impacting us globally today. The first is a growing population. We've, we've heard this you know, a lot, two billion more people by 2050. That's a lot more food that we have to provide and agriculture will be, and I would argue digital egg will be part of the answer for that. Consumption is changing with producers, really, or sorry, with consumers. They're looking at plant-based proteins. There's an increase in uh, fish and chicken consumption. So consumers want climate smart, transparent alternatives and solutions to where they're getting their food and what they're consuming. There's pressures on our ecosystem. So through climate change, through, as Garth said, urban sprawl, we're actually, we actually have less land per capita, and that will continue to become less as we move forward. And finally, advances in digital ag. I know, I <laughs> don't know where I'd be if I couldn't be connected to my family and peers all the time, and I, I think most of us feel that way now. We can't imagine a time like that. But our business and how we do business has also changed. So we're all connected globally, and that's through digital, and that's also how we, um, do our business. So as the population continues to grow, agriculture needs to provide sufficient food, recognizing the importance of sustainability and traceability because that's what our consumers want. Increased productivity with the enhanced sustainability really will be enabled by digital tools that we use today and that will come from in the future. So I'm not sure if you can see the words on here, it's pretty small, but um, this is a, a digital adoption curve, and you can see agriculture is that blue dot on the bottom. So we're really at the beginning of this adoption curve, especially when you compare to other industries. But if you look, time is also on the bottom. That's the, the x-axis. So we're, all, we're at the beginning of it, but part of that is because 
it's, we've really only been in this space for a relatively short time. I would argue in the last five to seven years is really when the digital side of, I, I, Precision Egg's been around longer, but the digital side has really been only around for the last five to seven years. So what does that look like and how is that gonna change as we start to ratchet up that S-curve? So if you look at this, adoption of digital tools acceler is accelerating, but we're just beginning to have a direct impact on key on-farm decisions. And I think that's really key about how we're moving up this curve. So to date, it's really been about data collection and visualization. We're really good at collecting maps, making maps. Um, we're really good at you know, wanting our data in one place. But in order for us to move up that curve, what we need to recognize, it's going to be about the decisions we make from that data. So we're looking for recommendations. That's what farmers want. I'm a farmer. I want that data to give me recommendations. I want it to work for me. It's my data. So I, we see pest detection, precision sea and spray, um, timing recommendations, drone-based applications. That's all going to be accelerating. And then ultimately, when we're starting to talk about sustainability and carbon, digital is going to be the key for us to understand and for us to quantify what that looks like on our farms. I believe also that the ag marketplace, um, the, what we, the, the term we always hear, uh, what is it, farm to fork, that's all enabled by digital. Garth used a really good example about the beer can, that being able to follow the journey. And, and that's what our consumers are wanting. So when we... When we asked our customers what they need from digital, what they came back to us with was agronomic insights that are easily, easily identify opportunities for my operation. So climate field view, we're, I work for Bayer, we, we're, we're in a partnership, we, we, that's how, what we're part of. So we're looking for areas of opportunity that we can provide and solutions we can provide to our growers from the data. But I also would argue that this isn't just about us providing them with all the solutions. This is recognizing that there's other platforms and other companies that also have solutions and we need to work together. So some of these opportunities are going to be about partnering with other groups. I think the other part of this is that really when we talk about opportunities on our operation, what, we're, what cu customers are asking for is they want us to focus their attention. We're providing a lot of information, or, or customers are constantly, you know, being, there's a lot going on for them, and so they need us to focus, what do I need to pay, pay attention today so that I can make my life easier? <laughs> and maybe what I need to pay attention to is different than my neighbor, and it's definitely going to be different than what I need to pay attention to in two months from now. So when we asked our customers, where are we today and where are we trending? When we asked them, what are the most important features a digital platform can provide to you? This is what we got back. VR fertility, yield mapping, mobile access, and soil mapping. Those are key features today that, that customers are looking for. However, what we recognized as well is what are the top changing features? What's trending up? What's really ratcheting us up that S-curve? It's going to be disease identification, crop protection recommendations, and crop planning. So, I think variable rate is something you're going to hear a lot about, and I, I think we've all been hearing a lot about it, but we, I, would, I would argue that we haven't been doing a great job of utilizing it. And as Garth said, maybe part of it is because we have failed to really identify what the expectations of farms are. Maybe that's why they haven't been using it. But most equipment has the ability to do variable rate, but I think they say 15 to 30 percent regionally are, are actually utilizing it. So I'm going to challenge that in the next eight years, we're going to be leaning into this, and this is what's going to take us kind of up that curve, because they, what they're suspecting is, or what they're, um, the indications are that variable rate technology is pro projected to have the highest growth rate by technology for in the precision farming market. I'm going to just flip ahead, actually, oops to this slide, so I can talk about it. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to talk about now is kind of how field view, how, how we're working with customers, working with their data, so that we're providing those insights when it comes to what their data, what they can learn from their data and what their data can provide them with, opportunities. So in this image here, we have field health imagery, a prescription, an as-applied map, and then a, a yield analysis map. map. And I want to take us through kind of the journey of the season, what, how a customer can use this information make decisions off of it, and then validate it. 
So I'm just going to jump back a few slides to this one. So insights from the data. So this is a field, field health imagery. If any of you are familiar with um, the field view platform, we provide field health imagery for customers. And what field health imagery looks like, it's, it's, not, um, it's a little different. Because what we do is we take the average biomass. This is like a biomass map. Average biomass is that light green. And that average biomass, we basically then segmented it to above average and below average. So darker green is above average biomass and the red and the yellow is below average. So this image was taken, I believe, early July, right before fungicide timing. And the customer and their agronomist were basically making decisions on what fields warranted a, a fungicide application. So they, they got this image, um, they went out into the field, take, you can take your phone um, and actually drop a pin on the, when you're in the field, and you can make some notes. So, they wanted to understand what was happening in that below average biomass area. That red area of the field, so they, I don't know if you can see, but they dropped some of the red pins, and they were able to scout and take some pictures and make some notes, document what was going on, and that's saved in the platform so they can go back and look at it later on. So as you can see in the picture, it's a really poor emergence. Um, not what you want your canola looking like at the beginning of July. And as they were able to determine, it was kind of a, a low spot in the field. They'd had a few heavy rains. Emergence was poor. Um, just not a real great looking area of the field. They went, then went to the green area of the field and dropped some pins, took some pictures, made some notes. So what you'd kind of expect to see for mid to early July, you know, a, a good looking canola field in flower. Um, conditions were right. It looked like it could use benefit from a, from a, fertil uh, a fungicide application. However, there was that other, there was a poor part of the field. So, so how, how do we make a decision on this? Well, what they did is they actually did a script. They, they created a prescription for fungicide on this field. And what they did is they took out that red area, that below average biomass area. And they even went a step further by doing in, um, inverted check strips in both fields, both areas. So what that means is in the area that they sprayed, they left an unsprayed check. And the area they didn't, weren't planning to spray, they actually left sprayed. They did a, a check. There was an application. And by doing that, um, by doing that, that, that map, that was 17% I mean, of the field they actually didn't spray. So that 17% less fungicide, uh, uh, re reduce their fungicide application by 17%, that's money in their pocket. Now we're going to talk about, I think that's, that's one, that's great, and uh, to Garth's point, we, but customers want to know, you want to know what, what's the ROI on that? Does that make sense? What can we learn from, from that insight and that decision and that action we took? And I'm going to argue that this, this is a yield map. This is just a pretty picture. I mean, Lots of growers have yield map data, but if they're not using other tools to validate it, it it's, it's, it's really not doing anything for them. So we want to talk about the validation opportunities that happen within, uh, that, you, that you can take advantage of. So because we did an as-applied, we have, we have a script, then we have an as-applied map, we can actually take this to a, the validation process. So in this case here, what we did is they were able to take the region that was unsprayed, I don't think you can probably see that, but the top is the unsprayed area of the field. So in that area, they were able to determine around about 16.7 bushels to the acre. In the inverse check, where they actually sprayed, it ran 16.8. So I would argue the yield difference is really insignificant. By spraying that area, they really didn't see any kind of a yield bump. However, when you look at the area of the field that they did spray, that ran uh, 20, sorry, what they sprayed ran 32.7. And what they didn't spray ran 29.7. So we saw a three bushel bump in the applied fungicide. So, uh, you know, a roughly 50, depending on the price of canola today, <laughs> I think we use $19 here. Uh, that's, that's $57 an acre is what they made in addition with that application of fungicide. So the thing I really want to point out here is I think there's some key learnings they were able to, to get from, from this, this application. Number one, 17% of the field didn't need spraying. So check, we've saved some money. But I think the other part of this is that I know as a, as a farmer, if I drove by a field that was only going to run 30 bushels the acre, I wouldn't even have 
to be honest, especially with a big area that had poor emergence that looked kind of crappy, I wouldn't have even considered spraying this field with fungicide. I would have said, no, it's not, that's not worth my time, my money. I'm going to move on to something else that is. But what the learning we had here was that actually if you take out the area of the field that doesn't warrant spraying and you focus on the area that there is an opportunity, there is a positive ROI in this case. And I don't think I would have learned that if I hadn't been, or I don't think the customer would have learned that if they hadn't been utilizing some kind of a, a VR script. And in this case, it's a simple binary script. It's an on-off script. So in closing, I guess I just want to point out what are the other opportunities we can get from VR? I think this, this example used fungicides, but there's also the examples of VR in um, seeding and with your, your seed and your, your fertilizer. And I think top dressing is another real big opportunity in season. You know, and again, focusing on just the area of the field that you're gonna get that yield bump in, placing those nutrients where, they, where they're needed and where they're gonna be utilized. So in that, I just kind of want to thank you for the opportunity to present and speak to you, and I look forward to answering any questions later on. All right. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, just for the sake of time, I'll, I'll go through my introductions while they, they pull up my slideshow there. So. Uh, my name is Christian Hansen. Um, I'm here today on behalf of John Deere, and I'm the Region 4 Small Grains Agronomist, um, and uh, that's the small territory of Western Canada, uh, the northern and central plains of the U.S., and Australia. So, um, yeah, a little bit of uh, a territory to cover there. But um, today I'm here to talk to you a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the newest and, and latest and greatest innovations from, from John Deere and, and uh, you know, how we kind of see the future of precision agriculture and you know we've heard a lot today about prescription uh, applications and um, you know potentially how John Deere is looking at the future to more of maybe an onboard solution uh, to execute some of those prescriptions so um, so before I really get into you know some of our key focus areas I, I just wanted to kind of go through the innovation process at, at Deere because things have kind of changed recently um, you know, the, the old uh, method at, at Deere has always been, you know, bigger, faster, stronger. The, the smartest guy in the room was the guy that said, hey, let's build a bigger tractor. Um, those days, I don't, I don't know if you guys have passed, you know, a large drill on the road or on the highway, um, you know, uh, recently, but machinery is getting really big. Um, and, you know, we're kind of getting to the limits of what even like our road systems can support. So now what Deere is starting to look at is, you know, how can we start to add more value to our equipment from, you know, an agronomic perspective? And that's, you know, part of the reason that I have a job today. And, and uh, you know, Western Canada has never had a agronomist before that has worked for John Deere. You know, we've had our dealers that have had agronomists for years, but Deere, you know, this is really the first time that an engineer has had an influence in the engineering process and the design and the development of equipment and digital solutions. Um, so, you know, getting back to the innovation process. So the, the way that our team sort of starts is we start with an idea. So obviously, you know, we need to look at the agronomy. You know, does it pan out for the grower in terms of the economics? What stage of job execution is it at? And then, of course, you know, we look at industry trends. So, um, you know, we, we've talked a lot today about, you know, drones and, you know, some of our competitors and some of the um, products that they're bringing to market. We watch that very closely to see the success of those and, and you know, basically if we develop something, um, are growers going to demand it and are they going to want to pay for it? <clears throat> Once we have that idea, we then go to our industry groups, we go to producers, we go to our dealers. Um, we even look at literature reviews from academia um, to see, you know, is there something here and, you know, and looking at the next bucket there, we look at that market opportunity. So, you know, with all of those things and, and all those inferences that we make talking to the different groups, you know, is there a market opportunity? And then, you know, we come up with that hypothesis. If we do X, we will get Y. Then we develop that potential future uh, solution concept. So, um, you know, we call these mule builds. Um, you know, basically they're, they're the duct tape and, and sticks put together to basically see if we can actually do that thing in the field. Um, it, it doesn't have a lot of polish on it. It's, you know, far away from commercialization. But we just basically make sure that, hey, this agronomic concept is going to work if, if we develop it. 
Lastly, we prioritize it within our portfolio. So, you know, my, I'm an agronomist um, and I, I work with a lot of engineers. I, I tend to have a lot of ideas that the engineers then tell me we can't do that because it's too hard or, you know, it, maybe in the future we can look at it. But, um, you know, basically what I'm getting at is we have a lot of ideas and we can't do all of them and we need to make those incremental steps um, towards that solution concept in the future. And, um, make sure that it's, uh, you know, prioritized correctly within our portfolio and what growers are going to demand next. Okay, so these are specific to the small grains market. So when I talk about small grains, I'm talking canola, wheat, and pulses for the most part. And, um, uh, sorry, uh, canola, cereals, and pulses. Um, so those are the, the key fo crops that we focus on. Um, Obviously, our, our priorities with uh, like corn and soybeans are going to be a little bit different, but at least for small grains, our priorities are you know seed placement. So this is uh, largely like our air seeding group. Um, you know, we we uh, of course work with uh, the combines and uh, you know making sure that we have good residue management, things like that, because that all plays into seed placement. Um, plant health. Uh, so the the big one that we brought to market recently is our, our harvest lab on combine, which is a, a protein sensor. Um, so, you know, we can use that to infer uh, fertility rates, but, you know, in the future, it's going to uh, look at more in-crop sensors for plant health and, uh, you know, using our, our sea and spray systems, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit here. Um, and the lastly is, uh, you know, pest management. Um, so this is, you know, disease and weeds. Um, you know, the, the big one that we've talked about already is, uh, you know, optical uh, selective spray technology is, is what we call it within DEER. Um, and that's the, the green on brown solution and, and the green on green solution, which again, I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit here. Okay, so around precise seed placement. So I, I have a couple of videos uh, running on the, on the slideshow here. And you'll notice that in, in, that, uh, in that top one there, there, there's a combine. So we, we really take a systems approach at Deer um, when it comes to each of these, uh, each of these top priorities. And, um, you know, obviously the, the combine plays a big role in, in, uh, in seed placement. So as a, as a key market driver around that, um, you know, uniform emergence. So it, it, it's about behind the combine residue management. And it's also about, uh, you know, things like seed depth and, and the metering system that, that's behind uh, the drill there. You know, what, what can we do to make sure that every single seed that we put in the ground has an equal opportunity to, to germinate, grow, and, and contribute to yield? Um, management intensity. So I, I heard it in one of the past presentations, but we're, we're not getting a lot more land. Um, so is it better to farm 5,000 acres really efficiency or buy another 5,000 acres? You know, and that's assuming that you can't turn around and sell those 5,000 acres immediately. So, um, but uh, what I'm getting at is, you know, growers, um, you know, I think they understand that uh, managing every acre uh, efficiently is is more important than having um, you know a lot of acres so it's it's more about the quality over quantity and lastly seed genetics so um, I used to work for Monsanto and Bayer I, I know how expensive canola seed can get um, you know especially with the the seed treatments that are on it um, but looking at the future there's you know other products that are coming to market you know we we think about things like hybrid wheat um, and uh, you know the role that that's going to play in our production system and uh, you know we need to make sure that um, farmers are able to utilize those products to their full potential so we work very closely with some of our industry partners to make sure that the technologies that deer are bringing to market are in conjunction with uh, with the product companies okay so so uh, you know I, I touched on this a little bit earlier but um, you know what that gentleman in the in the image is uh, is playing with is our, our harvest lab on combine sensor so this is a uh, this is a new technology from Deer. Like a, so, protein sensors have been in the market for for several years already, but Deer has uh, finally brought one to market that uh, is is integrated with our displays. So, um, and you know, I, there was a lot of talks yesterday around protein content in in canola, and uh, you know that that's obviously something that this sensor is capable of doing. It it, it can um, you know we've we've got our curves largely figured out for wheat and barley, um, and canola is on that list as well. But if we think into the future. Um, this is this is really going to become a grain constituent sensor. So we're going to be able to, um, you know, sense anything that our, our engineers are able to come up with, uh, whether it be oil, um, potentially, you know, things like gluten. Um, basically, it's going to come down to, uh, you know, uh, the quality of the product that you're taking off the field. So 
Um, key market driver around that, uh, nutrient use efficiency, and, and specifically, um, you know, with, uh, with the government legislation, uh, nitrogen use efficiency. So in the bottom there, we, we've seen a lot of VR maps today. That, that's one generated using the Harvest Lab on Combine. Um, so we're, we're basically able to take yield, protein, and measure and uptake and removal. Um, so this is a really uh, efficient way of generating those maps, and, and this could potentially reduce the amount of times that you need to soil sample, um, you know, if, if the sensor is capable of measuring that end uptake to, uh, to uh, you know, a sufficient level. Um, the grain marketing aspect, so I, I, I touched on it a little bit earlier, um, but, you know, basically we, we're going to know exactly what we're putting into the bin. Um, so this brings up a lot of um, opportunities around finding grain buyers that are looking for very specific constituents around uh, around the grain that we produce. So, you know, whether it be the grain millers that are producing flour or um, potentially the, the, the maltsters that are looking for a very specific protein of barley. Um, in the future, uh, the canola protein market is going to play a huge role in this. Um, basically, the, the grower is going to know exactly what their grain has and um, you know potentially capture some of those premiums um, to, to sell it to those grain marketing uh, firms and again I, I've touched on this before but the the big driver around this one is uh, you know that that 30 percent reduction by 2030 um, measuring grain constituents is, is going to play a massive role in uh, in reducing um, or sorry improving nutrient use efficiency and, and reducing our overall uh, fertilizer consumption so um, in the future, some of the other things that maybe aren't necessarily on this slide are how we could use some of our, our sea and spray technology to um, enable on-the-go prescription rates. So um, we have a lot of cameras on, on a sea and spray system. I, I believe there's 32 uh, across the entire 120-foot boom. Um, that's a lot of information, and there's a lot of things that you could potentially do even with our basic system, which is just sensing green. Um, you could use that as a biomass proxy, similar to how growers use NDVI maps and, and other remote sensing methods today. Um, so there, there's a lot of potential for that as well. Um, precision pest management. <laughs> so uh, if you're not aware, Deer actually has two uh, sea and spray technologies today on the market. Um, in small grains in particular, we, we only have uh, sea and spray select technology. So that's, that's the green on brown solution. And, and you can see it there operating in, in, the, in the video. Um, basically what it's doing is, it, as, as Joy mentioned, it's looking for green and it sprays green. It's, it's a very simple system, only works on color, um, and uh, in, it, it can be used for a lot of things, but it, in, in the grand scheme of things, it, it's, it, it's uh, not as sophisticated as our other system, which is Sea and Spray Ultimate or, or a green on green solution. Um, so the, the Sea and Spray Ultimate works on more of a machine learning um, method. So it, it's using both color and shape um, to identify the weeds. Um, and sorry, it, I, I should mention that the way it works today is it actually identifies the crop. Anything that it doesn't recognize as the crop, it sprays um, as long as it recognizes it as a plant. So uh, it works in a little bit of an inverse method that way. But you know, the future of that technology is uh, you know potentially identifying specific weeds that you have in your field. Maybe you have herbicide resistant kochia. Um, that system could be trained to look specifically for kochia and, and spray it a very specific way, either with a, uh, a different active ingredient, maybe a higher water volume. Um, there are a lot of different things that that system is capable of in, in the future. Um, the other big one is, is uniform maturity. So you know we want to make sure that. Uh, you know, we're, we're controlling weeds, um, you know, across the field and, and, you know, not spraying the spots that don't need to be sprayed because we know that there, there's potentially a yield penalty to spraying crop that doesn't need to be sprayed because it still has to metabolize that chemical. Um, so there, there's a lot of potential there. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention on is uh, on the bottom there is actually a seed destruction, uh, seed destructor. Um, so we're in a relationship now with with uh, with Redicop, where we're actually able to offer that system, uh, you know, basically from the factory. And uh, as a systems approach, you know, we uh, really feel that you know solutions like that, integrated with something like our sea and spray technology, is going to enable growers to have a, a much more effective uh, herbicide management plan. 
Obviously, sustainability is uh, is a massive part of you know the reason that we're bringing the the sea and spray selective uh, spray technology to, to market. Um, you know, anytime that we can tell the public that we're using less pesticides, uh, less chemicals on our on our crops, um, is a is a huge marketing win. So, as we look towards the future, um, you know, just that overall reduction and uh, and you know the 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 benefits that that's going to bring um, for the public perception of our industry is uh, is massive. So. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of where deer is looking, and as as I mentioned, um, the future is is going on board. <laughs> um, you know, we we obviously see a lot of potential in in prescription maps, but uh, one of the biggest hangups is is that growers are um, you know not super uh, confident and and uh, you know familiar with all the methods that we can use to generate those prescriptions and. Um, it, I, I think it was Garth mentioned, uh, you know, if that prescription doesn't work as soon as it is in the field, um, farmers going to turn it off and, and just seed with a, a blanket rate or, or, you know, some other methods. So what we want to do is we want to make it as convenient as possible so that growers actually utilize this technology. And, and like I said, I, I think that that's the future um, with autonomy and, and everything else that, uh, that we're bringing to market. So. And uh, that's all I have today. I'm really looking forward to the discussion with uh, Joy. <clears throat> all right. Thank you, Gar. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Christian. Those were great presentations. Um, as Bonnie mentioned at the table, we're really, we didn't coordinate that. We thought there might be a lot of overlap in our presentations, but I think they were very, very complimentary and very, um, uh, I guess, enhancing the conversation that I think we're about to have. So it was really, really great. So thank you all. And thank you all for being pros about introducing yourselves, because I wasn't nearly as organized as I should be to actually introduce you. So thank you for that. All right, so I think pretty much all of us or all, all of you addressed um, adoption rates around adoption rates of, of precision ag and, and technology. So what, what do you think is, is most surprising or what surprises you most about where the current adoption rates are at? We'll start with Christian. Hello? Nope. Hello? Oh, there we go. Um, so yeah, the, sorry, uh, current adoption rates was the question, correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so I, I think that, you know, the, the biggest thing that, that strikes me is, is the low numbers of VR adoption. And, and, you know, we have a lot of data out there from, you know, different surveys that we've done with growers and, and the reasons that that adoption rate is so low. But, you know, what, what really surprises me is, you know, with the, with the cost of everything, um, you know, from seed to chemical to, you know, of course, equipment, um, you know, that the growers are not utilizing some of the tools that they have available uh, to their fullest potential. And uh, again, we know the reasons for that and, and we're trying to address it. But um, if there if there's one message that I, I could potentially have, it's that, you know, you, you have a lot of data on your farm. You have a lot of data layers that come off of your equipment um, from satellite imagery. Uh, you know, potentially you're using things like drones on your farm. Um, use those because they're going to save you money at the end of the day and it's worth it to, to invest in those technologies. Not surprisingly, I think I'll mimic what Christian said. It's really that the adoption rates have been as low as they are. I think, as I, I alluded to, I think 15 to 30 percent is, is all that's really in the markets being used with customers. So, again, it's, it's I think, uh, Garth made a really good point about how it's about setting the expectations and I think that's the other thing if I don't know that we always want to say I think farmers always want to save money but they're not often afraid to spend money if it's going to make them more money and VR has the opportunity to maybe allocate those resources in a better place that will allow them to make more money by spend, spending the same amount even so I, 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 I agree there's a lot of data there's a lot of information and I think we just need to make it usable and set those expectations so customers are actually utilizing it. I'll go the other way on it. Um, <laughs> I think there's been a lot that have tried and had negative experiences because it wasn't set properly. Um, and there's also 
there's no, there's nothing the grower says, oh, well, why do I want to change? And I think that is, well, I'll just keep on that constant path. It's, it's treated me well. And unfortunately, if we don't change, it's not going to help. And unfortunately, if we don't change, we're going to die. And that is the aspect of what's coming. Like we have changes coming. We see what the industry across the world has done in different aspects. So we have to adopt change. Is that going to mean that everybody's going to be VR? Probably not. There's going to be different aspects, but that's where our adoption has been slow and there's been no need for them to do it. So that's probably the biggest reason. So I want to dive into the, uh, how do we address those negative experiences, I guess, but I have a quick follow-up question specific for Bonnie, actually, just based on a comment that you made in your presentation where um, you're projecting like massive increase in, in VR adoption, which is great. What is that based on? And what does the industry really have to do to make sure that we can, we can enable that? That's a good question. Um, I think we have to provide them. It, I think that the technologies we have need to work better together is probably what I would say. And that's, I think that we've recognized that, you know, farmers have the technology in their equipment, but they haven't maybe felt comfortable with the tools that they need to utilize to execute. So what we see is that we see the adoption going up because investment's going up in the, in the digital space, in the ag sector for this very reason. And so that it, it's just going to be a little easier. We're going to gain confidence. You know, every time a farmer has a positive experience, they tell their neighbors, and that really helps with growth. So I think making it easier to use, be more confident in what they're using, it will grow. And then it, it becomes, too, the, the carrot of the stick, I mm -hmm. think, a little bit with, with legislation, where we're going, um, what, some of the, so what some of the requirements that are, might be coming in the future are going to look like. So perfect segue, I guess, into the next question then around, um, so I guess, reversing those negative experiences, like you said, make it easier to use, make them more, more confident in, in the technology. How, how do we do that? Is it, is it training the users and providing them with skills? Is it having customer service that, you know, like Garth mentioned, is a very trusted, trusted advisor and is there for them and, and able to answer questions when and when they have them and when they need them? Is it, or is it a combination of all of that? How do, we, how do we make sure that we're positioning farmers to best utilize these technologies? Can I answer that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think all of the above. Yeah. I, think, I, think, I think we have to do a better job of training. We have to do a better job of, of uh, you know, just improving usability and, and that overwhelm. And, and I, I think I'd use the example of, you know, in, in my example, I showed a, a fungicide script. I would argue that most customers are not comfortable making a script today. And ultimately, you kind of got to stumble and work your way through the first one. And once you do it and, and you set the expectation and you learn from it, that's kind of step one. But I think working with a trusted advisor, and the trusted advisor looks different to different people. I would include, as a farmer, anyone I work with within my business, if I'm working with them, it's probably because I trust them and they're a trusted advisor. So maybe that's my banker, maybe that's my agronomist, um, maybe it's my equipment provider. So I think we have to look at that kind of as a holistic approach almost. It, the, everyone that we're working with needs to be a trusted advisor and we need everyone to be on board with this. Great. Yeah, I would, that's 100%. Um, that was what we learned 16 years ago. There was three of us, young guys going, flying out to the farm and uh, we were so happy, go do the work, sit in front of the grower, slap the map down, he looks, oh, that's a beautiful map, but that's not my field. <laughs> and that was because, you know, we didn't ask the right questions. Uh, we developed a product uh, called Runtime to try to address that. And that's what we do prior to the drill even hitting the field because you brought it up, Joy, Guess what? How does this, how do I not have to use this? Do I just click this button off? Yep. And that's what happened. <laughs> and so that's what we try to work with the grower. And if you don't educate, you will not have success in this industry. And that's probably the biggest thing. Yeah. So, um, 
you know, from from a from a deer perspective, we work, we work very closely with our dealers to ensure that you know when we when we sell a new piece of equipment to somebody that they understand how to use it and you know the execution of prescriptions and, and stuff like that is is part of that process. But um, you know the the biggest thing and and the biggest limiting factor for a grower is time. Um, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of growers um, over the years and. And the biggest issue I've had is is just getting in touch with them or or sitting down with them to you know actually get the point across um, you know that that we want them to do these things, and you know just as a, as a parallel for that like I, I you know how many growers are in the room today you know um, there's probably more industry folks here than there are growers and that's because the growers are probably out hauling grain right now, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and to that point you know it, it it's difficult to. Uh, to get these concepts in front of them and, and make sure that they fully understand them before they can implement them on their farm because, like I said, there, there's just a bit of a gap between what the industry thinks farmers should do and what the growers are actually have time and are capable of doing. So if we can somehow find more time, uh, make it easier, like I said, with some sort of onboard solution, that's that's really the future and, and where we're looking. So. so I guess specific question for you, Christian, based on your presentation, because it, I, I agree that we need to figure out how to streamline and simplify the ingestion of, of data to make management decisions. But at the same time, we're opening all these new doors and potential opportunities, especially from like an agronomic standpoint. So you're an agronomist. So tell me how interesting or exciting or how much opportunity there is um, to now like better understand agronomic performance when you have data like protein maps. Like before, we never used to be able to tie actual protein variability within the field with the agronomic conditions. So like, how are we gonna simplify when there's just more and more opportunity to, to dive in even deeper? So what, what the majority of our, our more progressive growers are doing is they aren't the ones that are ingesting those maps. They, they have you know, the, the trusted advisor on their staff. Um, now that there's of course you know the economies of scale and and you know making sure that uh, you know you're actually able to afford somebody that that is capable of generating those maps for you. But I I think that that's you know part of the part of the future is that you know you'll you'll have the farm owner, but you'll also have you know those trusted advisors part of your team that are solely dedicated to to making those maps and um, understanding the data as it's coming off the machine because. Yeah, um, farm manager has too many things to do, so it, it's time to kind of delegate down to that staff and, and make sure that uh, you know they they're able to do that for you and and make sure that when those maps are generated, that your people that are actually running the machines are are using them. Mm -hmm. So, so we all we all talked about ROI. So let's dive into that a little bit more. Um, how so how does how does deer how does climate how does decisive how do you answer the question when a producer asks, well, what's the ROI for me? How do you answer that? Yeah, that, that's always a difficult question because I, I'm not sure if everybody knows, but green paint is um, maybe expensive sometimes. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, uh, the whole ROI question and, and you know, part of a, so I, I'm actually part of uh, the agronomy group. Um, you know, I work with the small grains team, but I, I, I'm also part of, uh, you know, Deere's uh, global agronomy team. And uh, you know, part of the strategy that we have going forward is uh, we, we've actually um, started a, a small testing network um, that we work in conjunction with our dealers called the, the LEAD Network, um, which stands for Local Economic and Agronomic Decisions. Um, and what you get as, as a grower part of the LEAD Network is uh, you get to kind of participate in, in trials that are, are either generated by deer, um, by your dealership, or you know, you could potentially design one yourself. Um, and through these trials, it, it, it's a basically a tool that you're um, able to execute the prescriptions to you know test whatever innovation you're looking to test, whether it be a new chemistry product, um, it could be a piece of deer equipment. Um, and you know, through these tests, it has automated automated statistical analysis. It, it can tell you very distinctly you know, did this innovation that I just paid $50,000 for actually pay for itself compared to where maybe I didn't use it. Um, so that, that's part of our strategy going forward is, is really uh, finding ways um, to make the agronomics a lot more clear. Um, you know, if you use this, I will get X, and if I don't, I will get Y, so. So if we're talking about ROI with regards to digital egg, 
because I think that I think we can quantify the actions we take and how that ROI adds up. But I think sometimes determining is the digital egg that I'm trying to adopt on my farm. What's the ROI of that? And I would argue that in in our case, how we see it is, you know, you've got John Deere, you've got climate, and maybe you work with uh, FCC, let's say. With those three platforms, you have the tools in front of you to calculate an ROI on your farm. The ROI that I think customers need to think about when they think about digital egg is it comes down, it comes down to their time. So what's the ROI that you're gaining or what's your, your time ROI is how I'd also look at what digital tools are doing. And really it's that time you invest, that initial time usually is your biggest uh, chunk um, in learning the platform. And then I would argue you should examine three to five decisions you made that have changed because of how you've made them based off of some kind of a digital input and, and really analyze, is there an ROI associated with that? So I, I just challenge you to take, maybe take a little different look at ROI when it comes to digital. I think it all starts at the beginning and I kind of brought that up, is that we have an ROI, but talk to the grower. What is he expecting? And I think you ha if you don't set that up to start with of understanding, because I may have a different idea of what a return on investment is. I have one grower up in Westlock that his ROI was because, and why does he do variable rate? Because he could gain a mile an hour faster combining. Well, what's that mean? Well, that was huge to him because his, his harvest condition, his time, is really condensed up there. So it's not always about, oh, well, I saved X uh, dollars. And I've had that with growers. Yeah, I, I got 300 tons still in my bin. Okay, great. But we need to actually talk. And I think that's a lot of the problem is we don't ask enough questions up front of what are you looking for as an ROI. We assume what it is instead of just asking the question, what does the grower want? That, that is a really, really good point. And, and, and as you just highlighted, it's going to be different for everybody, right? It's going to be different based on what their specific challenges are. Some of them are, it's going to be very focused on like dollars and cents or time saved or harvest window expansion, all those things. But it is really going to be different for each grower. So it, it, it needs to be discussed. But like you said, the, the grower themselves need to understand what they want to get out of it so that they can then assess whether it's going to be of value to them. So yeah, really great point. Um, so I think we all talked about, or at least alluded to, the 30% the emission reduction strategy, plan, target, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and I, I, I think we're all on the same page, and hopefully everyone in the room is on the same page as well, that it's, it's very much around emission reduction, not fertilizer reduction. So that's the first kind of clarifying point I always make when I have this conversation. Um, but, and we all know that it's... it's you know, there's a, a big focus on 4R, nutrient stewardship. So what, what role, or I guess to what degree, do you think um, precision egg tools can help address that 30% target? Is it going to help us get most of the way there, or only part of the way, or what variable, variables are still in play before we can actually say that, hey, precision egg has a huge role to play here? So I think it's coming down to looking at the fields and understanding it, and, and you brought it up great with the smart farm of what you guys are doing with that. But I think the understanding is, is that, you know, we take the protein sensor, we add all these layers of data to understand it's not, how do we manage it? It's gonna not be just a, hey, this key opens this door. There's gonna be multiple keys in the door that to address this or to meet what they are talking about of emissions, we're gonna to have to use them all. And so, yes, fertility is gonna be a large portion, portion of that, of understanding, okay, I'm placing that where it can be utilized, but I'm not over fertilizing. My plants can utilize this. Yes, I got higher protein, so my nitrogen use efficiency is higher. And I think that's one of the things, and that's generally in Western, well, in Canada as general, we don't have the data set of, oh, okay, hey, uh, I'm growing Brandon wheat and it has a nitrogen use efficiency of this, or I'm growing this Liberty canola and it has this, or I'm growing this, like we don't have that. 
And that's one of the things that I've been struggling for years and trying to get. We just don't have it. And that's where we have to get to. But that's my sin. Yeah, I, I would agree with Garth here that, you know, it's not going to be any one solution within Precision Egg. It's going to be multiple. And they're probably going to build off each other. Um, I think we're, w one of the things today, the technology we have today is definitely in the ability to script. I think that's a, a, a big part of it. It's not going to be the only answer, but if we can start making sure we're placing the, the nutrients where they're needed and you know, understand the nitrogen use efficiency curves, like that's going to be a, a big part of it. It's not going to be all of it, but it's going to be a big part of it. I think the other part is, is we can do all of these things, but if we can't show what we're doing to the powers that be, it, it doesn't matter. So documentation is going to be huge and it's going to be critical for us to validate what we're doing and to, I don't want to say prove, but I mean, ultimately that's what we need to do. We have to prove that the steps that we're taking make sense. And, and you know, as a farmer, I, it doesn't need to be beat into me if it means that I'm going to make more money or save money, that I'm going to adopt that, that process, whether or not there's a 30% cap or reduction in emissions, I'm going to adopt that if it makes sense. And I think most customers or most farmers feel the same way, but we have to be able to really document what we're doing so that we can, um, you know, proof on the paper half the time. Yeah, so um, obviously every, everybody kind of looks at the equipment manufacturers uh, as, as part of you know, the, the key piece to enabling precision ag, um, you know, obviously all the products go through our machines, we need to make sure that we're putting those, uh, those products in the right spots. But, um, you know, what, what I, what I really want to make, uh, clear, I guess, is, um, that, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, you know, um, you know, Precision Ag and the equipment manufacturers are, are just one piece of the puzzle. So, you know, as, as we think about, uh, you know, we work a lot with the industry partners, um, you know, Garth touched on, you know, seed products. Um, you know, I think that things like hybrid wheat and, and new uh, canola varieties that are, are coming to market are, are going to play a huge role in, uh, in, you know, getting that larger story around nutrient use efficiency. Um, fertilizer companies, you know, is, is there products that they have in their pipeline that, that can also, um, you know, be applied a very specific way with our equipment um, to, you know, kind of get a, a mutual benefit. So, um, you know, the, the equipment manufacturers are just one piece of the puzzle, um, but, you know, we, we rely very heavily on our other industry partners and the crop input providers to, uh, to kind of tell the whole story. So. Great. One of the things that I always point out when I have uh, a discussion with a grower about this 30% emission reduction strategy, um, like despite the despite the, the messaging around it, I guess, and despite maybe the fact that it it may appear to be a misinformed kind of guideline, I, I point out the fact that it, it could they they can still enact on it or they can still move towards that and still be a good management decision for their farm, right? Because it's really focused around for our nutrient stewardship and, and uh, cover cropping and rotational grazing and things that are just generally going to be, have a positive economic benefit and environmental benefit. So take advantage of the fact there's going to be programs and subsidization funding for adoption of these, these practices to help them make good management decisions for their farm and then hopefully... Um, the powers that be are able to quantify the actual emission reduction and show that, hey, we are actually hitting these targets and still producing as much or more than we were before. So uh, I think Precision Ag has a huge role to play in this, and we just we need to embrace that and, and, and enable it um, and then figure out how to quantify it. But yeah, a lot of it is going to come into record keeping and data collection, and digital tools are obviously really well positioned to do that. So, so I have one or two more questions, then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, if you're a canola grower, and I know, Bonnie, you are, but let, let's say you're a canola grower, you are just dipping your toe into precision egg and, and digital solutions. What's the first thing that you are likely going to be looking at? Or what, what, what's the technology that is most attractive to you? Yeah, so the, the low-hanging fruit on that one, obviously, is, is the prescription maps. You know, everything that we've talked about today. Um, you know, from, from an equipment manufacturing standpoint, you know, some of the technologies that if you don't already have them on your farm, um, things like pulse width modulation, you know, the ability to very precisely control rates, uh, you know, across the sprayer boom, um, you know, something like that is extremely valuable. Um, sectional control on your drill, 
there, there's a lot of waste and overlap, um, not only from a fertilizer standpoint, but from a from a seed standpoint. So there, there's a lot of cost savings that you can you can uh, realize just by utilizing those technologies. Um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about uh, you know the protein sensor. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of ways to prove the ROI on that one, um, you know, just by generating those, those end uptake and end removal maps. Uh, and, and, you know, you basically pay for that sensor in, in less than a year, um, just, you know, generating those maps. So, um, yeah, ton, tons of technology out there and, and uh, you know, things that, you know, we'd recommend that growers, um, you know, obviously purchase, but uh, it, it also has to make sense for your, for your farm. So, you know, I, I mentioned before the economies of scale. Um, you know, obviously, you have enough have to have enough acres for those purchases to justify themselves. So um, we understand that uh, very closely with the growers. So, yeah, this this I, when I, when we talked about this question earlier, when I I, it, I had to think about you know what what do we do on our farm? What do we need to do yet on our farm? In the last few years, we've really we have switched over to um, variable rate at seeding. Uh, with variable rate seed and fertilizer, and the uniformity in our fields has really impressed us. So I, that that's kind of was a, a good one, and it, as we all know, the price of fertilizer was a, a tad bit outrageous last year. So making sure we're actually applying the fertility we need in the right places, really smart, really, that's probably one of the ones ways you can save the most money kind of uh, as, easy, as easily or efficiently as, as possible if you have the equipment. Um, I think that's the other part is that if you have to pay to get into the equipment, that, that becomes a real barrier. But I would argue the next one really is, is utilizing your sprayer. Most sprayers, if they're in the last, you know, I'm not an equipment, um, I don't know everything about it, but I would say the last 10 years, probably most sprayers have that ability to do some kind of VR. And keep in mind that VR can still be an on off map. So there, that is a really good way to reduce the input costs. Um, and, and often that is technology we already have on our farm. So I think that's the other kind of, those, those would be my two recommendations. I can just say ditto, because that's <laughs> kind of the same. But it's, yeah, it, uh, you know, we've been looking at fertility for a long time. That, that's what I live and die by. I start August 1st, I end end of May, and that's, I look at the fertility aspect with growers. Um, we've been working with seed, you know, the, the biggest one with variable rate seed, especially when we're talking canola, we have to understand the seeding tools we are using. So this isn't the, oh, well, I got a variable rate drill, I can do it. Well, you need to understand what your drill is doing. And I'm not, I don't see color, I see performance. And that's more what I get down with growers saying, yeah, I want to do variable rate seed. Okay, have what is your what's your factor? What's what's your skew that you have? Because when I have growers that say, "Oh, well, I want to vary a quarter of a pound." Okay, yeah, not a problem. Can your drill do it? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> and I remember a long time ago, and I'll go back to flexi coil. We got, back in the day, we got down to low rate. You know, let's go to lower rates. Let's go to 1,000 seed weights. That's what we were basing it on. And we had this thing called a stutter. And now those that ran flexicoil equipment or New Holland case IH will remember this because the stutter meant the, the meter stopped turning. And when I learned that you don't put seed in the ground, it doesn't grow, every <laughs> grower learned that too. So again... The idea was strong, and that's why they came out with a segmented roller, so we could do these types of things. But again, understanding everything's great, but if it's not practical, it doesn't yeah. become real. It has to work. Otherwise, it gets turned off or ignored in the field because yeah. you need to go. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So, Garth, you don't have to say ditto on this one because you get the first answer. Um, what, what upcoming technology or technology that is coming down the pipeline most excites you and why? That's a loaded question. I know. Um, you know, we've, so this goes back, oh, now close to 18 years. We started playing with hyperspectral back then. Everybody thought we were a bunch of goofballs. <laughs> um, and we kind of were. Um, you know, we had this huge data set, but at hyperspectral, there is so many things in our industry that hyperspectral has. Um, 
And that technology, yeah, there's still a lot to be with it, but that's probably one. And I know no one really, everybody's like, oh, what, what's he talking about? Because it isn't on the top of people's list, but in the industry, if you've been into it, you and you start, once you start diving in, it's, call it, I call it the crack for soil people, because it is, <laughs> it's like you just keep scratching and there's something new. Like, oh, can I, I can do this. And, and I feel that is, the one that's coming, it's not going to be tomorrow, but it is, you know, on a 30,000 foot look, that is one we have probably some of the most opportunity in our industry to use and make it go even further. So that to, would be. To add a little bit of context to that, that we made, I think, even massive uh, steps towards making hyperspectral Im imagery more useful because of its scalability now that it's at satellite low or low orbit earth satellites are now deploying fairly high resolution hyperspectral imagery for for ag and it's pretty exciting as you know alex is really excited about this <laughs> yeah no it's it's fun it, yeah. it's one but it gives lots of opportunity okay i'm a soils major so i feel like now i should be following up with something similar but i'm actually going to go back to disease um I think as an agronomist, it's probably one of the toughest things to make a decision on is telling your client whether or not they should spray. I think most often you're going to take the high road and say, yes, you should spray for disease because you don't want to say no, you shouldn't have and have them have a wreck, right? So we have a lot of data and maybe being able to take that data. And, and I think this is something that's not that far off. I know we're looking at it. Should I spray? When should I spray and where should I spray? If we can use the data to help that gain some confidence or our customers, have, our users have the confidence to make those decisions from it, I think that's something that's not that far out and really has um, the power to, to take that data and give you some really good opportunities and insights. Um, so, you know, the, the past year with deer, I've, I've been exposed to a lot of cool things, I'm not gonna lie. Um, you know, there, there's, uh, all kinds of hardware that that's in the the pipeline right now that that's going to have you know massive uh, impacts on on agriculture. But I, I think that the thing that I'm I'm the most excited for actually isn't even a, a piece of equipment. It's um, uh, we recently made an investment in a company called Interplant, and uh, it, it it's basically a company that produces fluorescent proteins for plants. And uh, what I mean by that is they they make plants glow, <laughs> in the simplest sense. So. Um, they can actually insert genes, uh, marker genes, um, that, you know, if, if the plant is experiencing stress of some kind, whether it be nitrogen stress, maybe it's being eaten by an insect, um, it will produce these proteins that are then within the visible light range to be detected by a camera. And, you know, obviously with our sea and spray systems, we see a lot of opportunity with, with different sensor technology that can be developed to, you know, sense these different things within the crop. and. Um, I, I just think that that technology is so cool um, and, you know, the, the potential for identifying, uh, you know, problems in your field weeks in advance um, prior to, you know, what we do today, which is we see a problem and we take care of it, um, it just opens up the door for so many different technologies that can be developed. So I think that's the, the most cool one that I've seen. I'll, I'll tell you, Christian, that the, the glowing plant uh, technology is also the most exciting for the research team at Olds College. We've been talking about that for weeks now, ever since we attended a, a webinar on that. It's really, really exciting because um, right now the, the current you know, state is, is, is scouting or using imagery to identify areas of stress, but by then all stress is already evident to the point that it's visible, right? This is now more predictive um, in terms of when stress is, is going to start reducing yield. So yeah, I agree, it's pretty exciting. All right, we have roughly eight minutes left for questions from the audience. So if anybody in the room has a question they'd like to ask the, the panel or myself, you can stand up and go to a microphone and, and ask that question. And I believe there may be questions online as well that Sean will be able to share. Yeah, we've got quite a few actually, Joy. All right. So. <laughs> Did you want to start with one from, from online? Sure, I can start. Um, so there's a lot of mention about, um, you know, if it's not simple, it, it simply gets turned off. So um, one of the questions was, um, you know, what are efforts being made by large companies like Bayer, John Deere, Decisive Ag, to make sure that technologies um, work across platforms and are easily um, uh, compatible? 
Yeah, that's a that's a that's a tough one to answer. It seems like everybody and their dog has some sort of digital platform these days, so it, it, it's it's tough to make sure that everything talks. Um, you know, from a deer perspective, you know, we we have our operation center, um, and we we have a ton of APIs with with these companies. You know, Climate, um, you know, Zarvio, uh, you know, lots of drone companies have APIs with us. Um, so we we try and open that door, and and I think Deer has been um, you know fairly transparent that you know, we're not going to make recommendations for products that we don't sell. Um, you know, we'll leave that to the companies that manufacture them. But we also want to ensure that, you know, growers are able to use our platform to make sure that they can use those prescriptions and those recommendations made by other companies. So, um, yeah, so the long winded answer is, you know, making sure that, you know, we have those API integrations and, and uh, that the data flows seamlessly is, is a number one priority for us. So. Yeah, I would echo what Christian said, it's it's really about partnering with people like Deer um, so that we that the data can flow back and forth and that it's as seamless and easy as it can be through with our customers. Um, but partnerships will be a key component of that and, and APIs. I mean that that that's what's gonna make the user's life the easiest when they don't have to physically um, do the connection, but it, it it's done for you. So that you control, I would add to, <laughs> but um, th th yeah, that, that's a big part. The world works on shapefiles <laughs> and, and it's understanding how that implements, whether it's climate, whether it's deer, whether it's CNH, whether it's whatever. And it's making sure as a company, um, that is one of the things we strive to do is working with every company and that's to answer that question online is that's why we do that runtime file. We want to make sure that the connectivity is done before you ever hit the field. Because if you don't, guess what he does? Oh, it doesn't work. I'm busy. Click. I'll go to constant. So if you don't set up the start with of making it, making sure that it is ready to go, you are going to fail. And that's our job. So as a group, I got to make files that work in all these controllers, but I also have to make sure his controllers work. I don't see anyone at the microphone here, Sean. So I see question. there's a was there lady back Sorry. here. Okay, I get. All right, go ahead. Good morning. Hi, uh, Delaney Ross Burtnack with the Manitoba Canola Growers. Um, Christian, I, uh, as the um, science nerd, I'm loving the idea of glowing plants telling you that they're ill. Uh, but I'm already imagining the memes for consumers of uh, what the glowing plant is that I'm about to not eat. Who is who is bringing consumers along the journey as we come up with these technologies that have uh, obvious value for farmers and we in the echo chamber get it um but but who's who is it who's the res the people that are responsible for helping consumers get it as well and not become a barrier like we've faced in past technologies yeah for sure so so to, first of all um just so we're clear, your field's not going to be glowing. It's not going to look radioactive or, or anything like that. Um, it, it's basically the camera technology that, that would be able to, to sense those uh, specific wavelengths. Um, but yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. The, the public perception um, is, is a key uh, component to you know, how we position this technology. And um, you know, it's going to be part of our responsibility. It's going to be part of the, uh, the seed manufacturer industry, um, you know, assuming that these traits eventually make it into their seeds. Um, and, you know, obviously industry groups like Canola Council, like we're, we're going to be counting on everybody to uh, make sure that these perceptions um, of our technology is, uh, is accepted by the public because, you know, the last thing that we want is, is to put all this time investment and, and bring these awesome tools to growers and, you know, have them fail because, uh, you know, the public doesn't demand them. So, um, yeah, we're, we're going to be working closely with, uh, with a lot of industry partners because we can't do it on our own. Glowing fields would be a challenge for sure, yes. <laughs> Sean, another question? Hey, we've got a few on drones here for spraying. I'll try and uh, roll them together for you, Joy. Um, will drone, drones be um, able to spray traditionally high water volume jobs like desiccation or are they more of a, a supplemental tool? And then uh, I guess along with that, um, who's working with regulators to get drone approval for spraying? 
Um, and, you know, in the crop protection guide, there's already aerial application, a lot of labels. So um, wouldn't drones be um, even more precise and, um, you know, just be able to go into their area application? Okay. I'll do my best to answer those questions, but if anybody on the panel wants to as well. Um, in terms of who's working with the regulators yet, it, it's still the, um, the, the manufacturers of the technologies as far as, far as I understand. There's, there's not a lot of... Uh, like AFC or, or research involvement in, in that regulatory approvals yet, but I anticipate it, it will, just like it did for aerial applications and, and other applications. Um, and then in terms of can we just extend the label, labels that are approved for aerial application to drone application, my understanding is at this point we don't know if we can do that yet or not. There's a lot of additional variables with um, downwash and the variability of downwash and pressures of and dispersion of spray from drones that we, we haven't been able to assess um, to determine if we can just extend labeling for, for aerial applications. So lots of unknowns yet, and I'm definitely not an expert in that area, but I've had a few conversations with Tom Wolf about this, so there's lots, lots to explore and, and lots to, to figure out before we can be doing um, regulated spraying with drones. Anybody on the panel? Yeah, it's, um, I know everybody says, well, it's air, and there's air on the label, but it isn't the same air. And yeah, Tom talks about it, but that's one of the things we talked with others in the industry is that it is a different we don't have the data Let, let's just be honest we don't it's is it coming yes is it tomorrow no it's we're a few days away as we know government doesn't tend to move very fast um so but yes we will have to have a, a higher data set for this to be registered we know with on drone it's more also with our flight you know it, it, there's a whole lot of things that are coming into this. Everybody's like, oh, well, I just go to Best Buy, get a drone. Well, you're not going to go Best Buy and buy a spray drone, <laughs> let's be honest right now. And you will have to have an applicator's license. That was one of the things that I was told that it will be very clear. Um, this isn't just, oh, okay, go get one, and away you go. So yeah. it, do we have 100%? No. I think there's a question at the back of the room. Yep, there's a microphone right in the middle, or a microphone will make its way to you. Thank you. First, I have a comment for the, uh, I, uh, for the chair, just to uh, emphasize the uh, uh, reduction of emission of fertilizer use by 30%. That's very important. Even now, I read a lot of people get the a concept that say, yeah, we will, we will reduce fertilizer use by 30%. That's not true. So that's a very good point. Um, my second uh, um, point is when we look at uh, the um, precision egg, we always look at just the single factor. That's, that's why we quite often get the inconsistent uh, results. And uh, when we try to recommend the producers, very difficult. Just to give you a very uh, simple uh, example, when we look at, uh, say, uh, uh, canopy reflectance in relation with the fertilizer use, my experience is when your soil have a low pH, when you apply more nitrogen fertilizer, the NDVI actually is reduced, not increased. But if your soil have a pH in the neutral range, that's always give a nice curve. So what that I try to emphasize is quite often other factors than nitrogen limit your response. For example, macronutrients. If, uh, if one of the macronutrients is in your field is in limitation, you try to use the um, response curve, you cannot get that point. That's why you say, oh, this does not work. Let's forget it. That's, uh, that's, that's what I wanted to uh, Give us these points. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. They are they're incredibly important. And I don't think we any of us address it directly in that there are a ton of factors, a ton of various variables, a ton of things that, you know, even after decades of studying agronomy and crop respo response and limiting factors, we don't know everything yet, right? So really great point that we're trying to define, you know, precision egg tools and prescription mapping based on what we think is right in terms of nutrient uptake and, and limiting factors, but we don't know everything. Um, my, my colleague, doc, Dr. Alex Melnichuk is famous for saying that, you know, soil science and, and prescription mapping isn't rocket science. It's far more complicated than that because there are so many variables at play. 
um, and we don't fully understand all the interactions yet. So it, it's a challenge, but we, we have to, we have to move forward. We have to, you know, help help producers um, take advantage of, of some of the technologies we have available to be more productive and more sustainable because our our livelihood and our ability to feed the world depends on it. This thing is flashing red at me, so I think we're out of time. Uh, we just have one more question from the right. crowd. Okay. Okay. Uh, Chuck Fossey with Manitoba Canola Growers, uh, producer director. Anyways, I guess I ha actually I had two questions, but I'll keep it down to one. I'll talk to Christian later, but. Uh, my question there is, uh, you're talking about like these uh, sensors now for uh, on your combines that will be able to detect protein and uh, oil content and all sorts of other factors. And you know, as farmers, we're quite often concerned about that information and the ownership of that information because you know there's a debate already on just yield monitors and companies being able to download that information then maybe marketing it. And of course, you know, farmers are very sensitive about the fact that people are going to know what, as a group or an, in an area, what the yields might be because that impacts marketing. So, you know, if we get into other greater details and getting into maybe how much fertilizer farmers are going to be using next year, what pesticides were used, those are all a lot of issues I think are going to be very sensitive that farmers are going to be concerned about and might detract to some degree the use of precision agriculture. Um, so 100% agree with you. Um, I, I was recently talking to a grower um, that was, you know, we were looking at doing some trials with him and he was very hesitant to even show us his soil sample results and he's saying, well, that, you know, that's basically my bank account, right? You know, you basically know how good of a farmer I am and, and you know, the, the yield potential of my land. Um, just by knowing, you know, what I have in my soil and, um, you know, deer takes a very, uh, you know, proactive approach um, to the data that flows into our operation center. So to be clear, deer does not access, you know, grower data. We, we don't, like on an individual level, we don't look at, you know, how growers are, are using, um, you know, their, their different crop inputs, um, you know, unless they give us the permission to do that. Um, so, you know, to, to answer your question around, uh, you know, the, the protein sensor, um, that data is yours until you choose who you want to share it with. And, and there will be people that you want to share it with, whether it be potentially the government if they're offering some subsidies, it could be your grain buyer, um, because obviously they're going to want to know what product you have to sell them. Um, but from, you know, like if you didn't want, uh, you know, the crop input companies to know how, they're, uh, how you're using their products, um, you don't have to share that data with them. So just to make that clear. Yeah, data ownership is a really huge topic in, the, in this whole discussion. Um, so yeah, important to address that. All right, I think we wanna have time for 